Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is uh, Peter. I'm the uh, Peter Household. I'm the chair of Cork Astronomy Club and you're all extremely welcome to this uh, Zoom meeting of our club. Uh, in better days we meet at University College Cork but in bad days like this, well it's a good day actually because we have uh, Seth Shostak with us from California, so we wouldn't have got that on a normal day. Yes, well, I, I suppose it's fair to say that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is an enterprise that inspires both scientists and non-scientists, young and old, astronomers, and also those with little interest in astronomy. I, I suppose it responds to a deep-seated urge to know the perennial question, are we alone? And tonight, Cork Astronomy Club is very privileged to welcome one of the world's foremost experts on the scientific quest to answer this question. Dr. Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute is the, uh, the senior astronomer, astronomer at the SETI Institute in um, San Francisco. And that's where Seth is joining us from, where it's actually now just past midday. So welcome Seth. And many thanks for agreeing to join Cork Astronomy Club's meeting tonight. And uh, Seth, the floor is yours. All right. Well, th that's an appropriate level for my comments. Now, uh, just a, a couple of things. I am indeed speaking to you from the San Francisco Bay Area, although I am not in San Francisco, which, which I can assure you is actually of, uh, of benefit to me. Um, in San Francisco, in my opinion, should probably be tugged out uh, about uh, 10 or 15 miles into the Pacific and sunk. That's just me. You may not agree. I am in the uh, Silicon Valley, which is about as far south of San Francisco as Peter is north of Cork. Uh, so it's, you know, it's like an hour or so. And uh, the, in fact, Mountain View is the name of the town here. And uh, it's just below Palo Alto, for those of you who are familiar with Stanford. Um, Mountain View is actually probably most famous for the fact that the headquarters of Google is located here. And, uh, you know, it's a, basically a bedroom community for people who work here in the high tech industry of uh, Silicon Valley. You may wonder why the SETI Institute is located here, which it is in Mountain View. And uh, it isn't because of the cuisine, which is uh, somewhat, uh, you know, limited. It's simply because the NASA Ames Research Center, one of the several centers for NASA, is located here. And when I joined the SETI Institute, which was back in 1990, just before the, uh, the Boer War, uh, I, it, it was a NASA project. So, you know, the offices were located here near NASA. We're about three miles from the, the NASA Ames Research Center. Anyhow, we've stayed here, even though it's no longer a NASA program. All right. Enough of all that. Let's get on to it. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This is Zork. This this guy was sent to me actually by the makers of this particular uh, statuette in the hopes that I would uh, increase their sales, and I think that we did by one. Uh, but Zork occupies a place here in the institute for the amusement of visitors. We don't get very many visitors. If you were to come to the SETI Institute, you would find just an, another tilt up building here in the Silicon Valley with a bunch of offices and cubicles. And that's all there is. The antennas, which you can see behind me, the Allen Telescope Array, are located up in the Cascade Mountains of California, about 300 miles north of San Francisco. And they're located there simply because the mountains up there shield the antennas from all the uh, interference that you would get if you were much closer to the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, I'm gonna talk about sort of other ways of doing SETI than this. This is again, the Allen Telescope Array. There are 42 of these antennas. They're about six meters in diameter. So if you put one of these in your backyard, you would probably offend the neighbors. Uh, something that's not novel for me as it turns out, but the idea was to build 350 of these things. And uh, so what the Institute did approximately 20 years ago was approach Paul Allen. Now that name may or may not be known by you, but Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft Corporation together with Bill Gates. 
and uh, he had a lot of money because he had stock in the company, and he was interested in using the money for things that nobody else was trying. So we presented to him a plan to build 350 of these antennas in a big array and uh, you know, use it for SETI, yes, but also for radio astronomy. Is everybody asleep yet? Okay. Uh, so that that's, was the idea. But as it turns out, uh, the research and development for this antenna system was much more expensive than expected, and we could only build 42 antennas instead of 350. Here is Seth's rule for any telescope you're going to build, maybe not your home telescope, but maybe even there. Uh, whatever you think is the best estimate for the cost of building the instrument, multiply that by pi, and you'll get a much closer uh, estimate. So this thing has still only 42 antennas. We keep looking for new money to uh, fund this. Remember, in the United States, and indeed anywhere, uh, SETI is not funded by the government. It was when I joined the Institute. It was a NASA program, but that hasn't been true since 1993. So everything is funded by donations. Okay, now what we usually do with these antennas is we point them in the direction of nearby stars, hoping that they have a planet somewhat like the Earth, which has life that has evolved to intelligence and uh, you know some sort of society that's interested in broadcasting their presence, either deliberately or accidentally. So here are just some you know, uh, planets that have been found, exoplanets, that are at least the same size as the Earth. Nobody knows if they're actually like the Earth. All the detail you see on these planets is totally fictional. That's the, the work of artists. But this has been the traditional uh, approach. And in fact, these days, it's become even easier because recent papers where people have studied the results of the Kepler uh, space telescope have been able to interpret those data to mean that essentially one out of every two, maybe one out of every three stars has a planet that is approximately the same size as the Earth and in the habitable zone. Right, you may wonder what the habitable zone is, but I doubt that you do, because you probably all know that the habitable zone uh, doesn't include California. So the habitable zone is that region from the star where you know the temperatures might be uh, salubrious, like you'd find in downtown Cork, for example, but without the rain. So there, you know, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions, of planets in our own galaxy that could be like the Earth. We don't know that any of them is like the Earth, but the number of candidates is very high. And that's fundamentally why we think there might be somebody out there. It's hard to believe that uh, it, it can't be the case, but it also must be said that although this idea of trying to eavesdrop with big radio antennas on transmissions from other worlds, that, that idea goes back 60 years now, and we still have not heard anybody, okay? Now, when I tell people uh, this fact at parties, not that I get invited to many parties, but occasionally, if I do get invited to a party, you know, people will ask, well, what do you do for a living? And I usually make something up and, you know, I say I'm, I'm in the transmission repair or stuff like that. But uh, if indeed I am forced to tell people what I really do, they will say, well, have you heard anything? And I always find that a very peculiar question, because if we'd heard something, they would know about it. Obviously, I'd be on a plane to Stockholm to collect my prize, but we haven't heard anything. And so usually the second question is, are you close? And I really don't know what that means because this is a one bit experiment. Until you found the aliens, you haven't found the aliens. So there's no such thing as being close. Um, it's, sort of like, it's sort of like pregnancy, right? Are you pregnant? No. Are you close? I don't know. I don't know what that means. Maybe on Saturday night. Okay. So we haven't heard anything yet, but I have bet everybody the, you know, a cup of Starbucks or maybe a better cup of coffee that we will hear something by 2035. We can get back to that later if you're a coffee lover. But uh, the reason that I do that is because of the improvement in the equipment that we're using. But how do you explain this awkward silence? People do try. And here are some of the most popular explanations to begin with, maybe you all are the smartest things in the galaxy, something that many of the people here in California like to believe is true, but it's probably not true. <laughs> that would make you really special. And uh, of course, as you know, in 
in science, uh, if your explanation requires humanity to be very special, it's probably not a very good explanation. Another possibility is everybody's hiding because it might be dangerous not to hide. Maybe we just haven't looked at enough star systems. Personally, I think that that's probably the best explanation. The total number of star systems that have been looked at carefully by SETI is you know, measured uh, somewhere between maybe five and 10,000. But there's another possibility. Maybe the, the experiment's simply not good enough. Maybe we just don't have uh, receivers that are sensitive enough to do this. Okay, now, as you can see, this is just a little plot here. They say every time you show a plot, you lose 10% of the audience. Uh, I'm gonna show 20 of these. Now you can see this, this plot here just shows the uh, sort of the size of the largest radio telescopes in the world as a function of time. And uh, I guess you can take Arecibo off there now, but you can see that uh, you know they've been getting bigger at the rate of mm, one or two orders of magnitude per century, okay? So, you know, sensitivity is improving, but it's improving slowly because it's very expensive to build very big aperture radio telescopes, okay? And so that's a fundamental limitation. Here's a number for you, for those of you who want a number. This is a typical sensitivity. This is, uh, if you can't read that, it's like 10 to the minus 24 watts per meter squared per hertz. Okay, that's a very small number. In other words, the typical sensitivity of radio telescopes, uh, if you convert it to energy, it's been said to be the same as one ant lifting one leg partially. That's the amount of energy collected by all radio telescopes since the first one in the 1930s. That's not very much energy. So, you know, that sounds like it's a, a tremendously sensitive experiment, but it's really not. This is what it implies if the aliens are, say, 200 light years away, which would be, frankly, fairly close. You might be able to invite them over for lunch. At 200 light years, that would translate into a transmitter that's like 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 watts if they're broadcasting in all directions. If you assume the aliens aren't trying to get in touch with us deliberately, then that's the kind of power their transmitter needs to have for us to be able to pick them up. In other words, if you moved all our SETI experiments to, you know, the planet around Proxima Centauri, uh, you know, they wouldn't be able to pick up Earth, with a few exceptions. There, there's some radars they might be able to pick up. But in general, they would not be able to find us, even that close, what, 4.3 light years, whatever it is. Okay, so it's not terribly sensitive. And this number applies to all SETI experiments within an order of magnitude or two, right? which as you all know, in astronomy is considered high precision. Uh, in astronomy, if you get something right by a factor of two, that's considered high precision. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't let astronomers fill out my income tax forms because they'll get it right within a factor of two and consider it good enough. Okay, so all these experiments kind of have that kind of sensitivity, which is not very high, okay? And that, that, that just, it's just millions of times, a billion times more power in the Arecibo radar, I show you this, this photo because after all, you know, it's sort of nostalgic now. I spent a lot of time at this telescope. You can see the cables that hold up the uh, feed platform there. And uh, they started breaking one by one. Anyhow, the whole thing is sort of in a mess now. But it has this, one of the big advantages of this telescope is that it not only can receive, but it could also transmit. And it has a two megawatt hat, a two megawatt transmitter used for you know, bouncing radar off Venus, so you could see underneath the clouds in the early days, and or mapping asteroids, all that sort of thing. So it can do, if you will, active astronomy, which is hard to do with anything else. Anyhow, uh, this telescope, uh, you may know, a thousand feet across, I reckon once when I was down there that it would hold 2,000 million scoops of ice cream, which is not a good idea in the tropics, but it's a big thing, or was. Uh, whether it'll get repaired or not is still slightly up in the air, but I, I think it probably will not now. It's so, been so damaged, it's probably gone. Okay, and it is more than the total power used by Homo sapiens, right? The, uh, you know, humanity runs at about 10 to the 13 watts, 10 trillion watts. So that's, you know, everything you've got in your house, of course, but also your car, all the factories, the aircraft, the railroads, all this stuff 
comes out to about 10 to the 13 watts. In other words, if we want to hear ET, and ET is only a couple of hundred light years away, and not aimed directly at us, then the requirements on their transmitter is an amount of power comparable to all the power used by 7 billion people. And that's a lot. That's a lot. That, that might be too much even for ET. I mean, I never begrudge ET a little bit of energy, but that's an awfully, awfully big project. And maybe they would say, okay, that's maybe the kind of energy that would be required to talk to a society that's only had radio for 100 years. But, you know, we're assuming there's somebody out there that's had radio for 100,000 years, and they've got much better equipment, and we don't have to waste all those kilowatt hours trying to talk to them. So this is, to me, a fundamental problem, that we require them to be broadcasting a lot of energy. Now, of course, you could say, well, maybe they just aim it our way, and they could. This, this was a proposal for a radio telescope that was made in the 1970s, which, for some reason that I can't possibly fathom, was never built. Okay. Uh, it, it was going to cost a couple of hundred million dollars, which at the time was considered a lot of money. These days, it's, you know, the, my next door neighbors have more than that. So the power requirements could be arbitrarily reduced if they simply directed the energy toward us. And if they had something like this, you know, you'd hear them, even if their, their, their transmitter power was probably 100 watts or something like that. So, but the trouble with that idea is that they have to have some reason to beam a signal our way, okay? And there's hardly any reason to imagine they would do that. This is just a little sort of semi-3D plot of the nearest stars to us. I think you all know what this plot means. Uh, this is the nearest, I think, about 30 stars, something like 30 or 40. And those are the only people that you could even assume might be broadcasting our way. Because these are the only star systems where they would know about Homo sapiens and for which there's been enough time for them to send an inquiry to us, you know, like a... We'd like to sell you our used cars or whatever. They can't be more than about 30 or 40 light years away for them to have picked up the high frequency, high uh, power transmissions that began, began during the Second World War, pick them up and then, you know, respond to the earthlings with a big signal. In other words, unless there's somebody very, very nearby in a, in a couple of handfuls of star systems, you shouldn't expect that they're deliberately broadcasting anything to us. And that, that, again, I think it's a problem for SETI, okay? Yeah, they will know that there's life on planet Earth here, this spectra, the optical spectra of some planets you've probably heard of. Uh, Venus has carbon dioxide, probably not phosphine. Earth has, uh, you know, water vapor, uh, oxygen. That's the important thing for, for Earth, that oxygen line. Uh, and... Uh, Mars, you know, just has CO2, basically nothing. So any society that has adequately funded their astronomers and is, say, within the galaxy and not obscured by dust from our point of view or from uh, their point of view, we being obscured, they will know there's oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. So they will know that there's life here. That signal has been reflected off Earth for two billion years. And uh, so they'll know that, there, you know, there's photosynthesis or something like it here. Now, whether they find that interesting or not, I don't know. I mean, you know, just because Earth has cabbage doesn't necessarily mean they're going to gin up a hugely expensive transmitting effort to Earth. But, you know, that's the best you can hope for. I mean, how interesting would that discovery be? It, if biology is all over the place then finding oxygen in somebody's atmosphere happens all the time. And we're just, you know, another entry on a list you'll find in the back of the aliens astronomy textbooks. If biology is very rare, if cooking up life is a hard thing to do, then on average, they're going to be far away and we're not such a priority for them. Okay. So having said all this, let me just talk briefly uh, about an alternative approach after which you can grill me like a cheese sandwich, uh, asking those questions that, you know, I'm deliberately not addressing. What else could you do other than looking for signals? You could look for artifacts. You could look for things. Remember, the universe is three times older than the Earth. So surely if life is common, if intelligence is common, there are many, many, many 
societies out there that are a lot more advanced uh, than your neighbors. So maybe they've done something. It would be like asking, you know, the, uh, I don't know, <laughs> the, the, the Neanderthals, hey, what do you think uh, people will be building 30,000 years from now? And they would never imagine things like big cities and, you know, cell phones or any of that stuff. They, they couldn't even imagine it. So maybe there's something out there that we could find that would tell us that even if we didn't understand it, that there's somebody out there. Whoops. Okay. So they've had a head start. And there are advantages to doing this. To begin with, it removes this problem, the synchronicity problem. We aim an antenna at the sky at some star system, and we keep it at any given frequency for only a few minutes. So you have to hope that ET is sending a signal that's reaching your antenna just in those few minutes that you're actually looking. You know, that's, that's optimism of the first water. It also eliminates this problem. Uh, this guy, I don't know who he is, but, you know, I think he was some sort of theoretician there in, uh, in, in the UK. But he, uh, he said once something to the effect that, well, we shouldn't broadcast anything because you don't know what's out there. And you might just wake up some aliens that'll come to Earth uh, with their interstellar battle wagons and incinerate the planet, ruining your whole day. Now, you know, I, I have to take or I have to mention that I meant I, I spoke with this gentleman's uh, daughter after he made these statements. And uh, she said, well, you know, it wasn't so clear that his, you know, she, she agreed with Steve Hawking about this. Keep in mind that if Stephen Hawking had told you what his favorite delicatessen was or his favorite dry cleaner, you know, everybody would have said that's that's got to be real wisdom. But he was suggesting that at least for some societies, it may pay to keep a low profile. So maybe they're not broadcasting at all. The other advantage of looking for artifacts instead of signals is that they don't have to be around now. Uh, this is probably not a natural formation. There's a photo uh, in the desert, so just, uh, just to the west of Cairo, actually. Suppose somebody gave you the job. I want you to find out if there are any pharaohs on the planet, right? Well, there are no pharaohs today, but if you found this, you would have some evidence that they once were here. So the advantage of looking for artifacts, again, over signals, is they don't have to be around now. The artifacts could still be there, even though they're gone. Let me give you some examples. This is, uh, well, this is one of my thesis advisors. This is Martin Schmidt. So this photo was made back about 1968, 1969. Uh, but this fellow actually was the first to find the quasars. All right, he used the Palomar instrument. And uh, he found them. There's a whole backstory there, which is kind of interesting. And I'll tell you all when you're older. But Martin Schmidt found the quasars. And the first reaction of many people was that they were maybe not natural. In particular, some of the quasars seemed to go up and down in strength. The Russians were claiming this and thought that, you know, maybe, in fact, these were not natural processes, but signals from aliens. Well, it turns out that uh, that was all wrong. The quasars are natural phenomena. But in any case, we didn't understand what the quasars were back in 1967. And so aliens got the blame. This is still true in America, I think. OK, so anytime you come across any uh, phenomena that you don't understand, there's a tendency to blame it on the aliens. Here's 1967. This is a printout from uh, Jocelyn Bell, you know, using the Cambridge observatory there and you can see these little pulses in the second graph there on a very regular basis and uh, most of you probably know that the people at cambridge for a while called them lgms little green men now i don't know that they were serious about that but they didn't know what they were and they thought that they were so regular they had to be the result of intelligence well it turns out they don't have to be the result of intelligence they can just be the result of neutron stars but still again the aliens aliens got the blame Here's something more recent, only a couple of years ago. Uh, Tabby star, this was found in some Kepler data. And you can see this is just the brightness of the star. And you see it dips by more than 20% there for a couple of hours, a couple of days. And then it dips again. Those dips are not due to a planet transiting in front of the star, right? No, no planet, I mean, even if much bigger than Jupiter, would reduce the brightness of this star by 20%. So nobody knew what it was, and it was suggested by uh, a, a fellow at the Penn State University, 
that maybe it was an alien megastructure. In other words, something, you know, some sort of Dyson sphere, Dyson swarms that the aliens were building and it got in front of the, uh, the light from the star. Could be, could be, and this is a, you know, a Dyson sphere here, a, a, a total sphere it doesn't work, but you could have, you know, the sphere made out of little bits and pieces and that, that would work. And so maybe this is something that, uh, you know, the aliens are using to avoid the, the climate change, possibly. But it turns out that observations later showed that the dips, the light, when the, the, uh, the brightness of the star dipped, was redder than when it wasn't dipped. And that suggests dust. So it's probably just comet dust in that system. Still, could have been aliens. Could have been. Uh, here's Oumuamua from uh, three years ago, this interloper in our solar system. This thing comes in and, and it's on its way out of the solar system. It sort of looks like a long period comet, except that, you know, you can compute the uh, trajectory. And it turns out it is not bound to the sun. It is uh, an extra solar system uh, object. Nobody knows if it really looks like this. It's clearly longer than it is wide. That much you know from the light curve, but no, nobody knows that it looks like this. It's an artist's impression. Still in all, uh, most people said, oh, well, it's probably a comet, or maybe, maybe it's an asteroid. But <laughs> Avi Loeb, who at the time was the chairman of the Harvard Astronomy Department, said, nah, nah, nah. The chance is like, I mean, it's like, you know, your local pub. You know, you blindfold yourself and you throw one dart somewhere into the room. The chances that it's going to hit the bullseye aren't very high. And yet this thing came into our solar system almost on a perfect trajectory, you know, just swung around the sun and on its way out. And his argument was that unless there are lots and lots of these things, this was probably a, a rendezvous with Rama-like object. This was, if you could get close to it, like this artist's impression, you would see little portholes along the side and green faces behind the portholes. These guys had come in to survey uh, our solar system and then leave. <laughs> However, as it turned out, two years later, they found another one of these things. And, you know, it looks like there really are a lot of them, just a lot of darts. And if you throw a thousand darts into the room, maybe one of them does hit the, uh, hit the uh, bullseye. But this was another possibility. You should always consider this possibility, even though it's been zero for 50 by now. This is another uh, object, uh, extrasolar system object, 2 I Borisov, found by a Russian amateur. And you can clearly see this is a comet. Okay, uh, just some other interesting targets. Probably the most interesting place to look for ET is here. This is the galactic center there. So, uh, you know, if you're really an advanced species, maybe you're willing to make the trip 28,000 light years uh, to the center of the galaxy, because there's a big black hole there. There's lots and lots of energy to be harvested. There's plenty of material for building spare parts for yourself. Keep in mind that the most advanced aliens even aliens that aren't much more advanced than we are, are probably not biological. I mean, I know you all like biology, at least since the age of 12 or 13, but the facts are that biology is very fragile. You know, just, just think about it. You're born, and for maybe six years you have some fun, but then they put you into school, you have less fun. And then after, you know, maybe 20 years of school, you get out, you take a job for 40 years, and then after that, you get out of the job, and have a little bit more fun, and then they put you into the ground. This is not a good scheme for an intelligent species, right? It's kind of nutty. We are probably in this century inventing our successors, artificial intelligence that's able to write, you know, the great Irish novel. Uh, I've talked to people at Stanford in the artificial intelligence group there, and I say, is that true? Will we have somebody who can, you know, write better stuff than Oscar Wilde? Will we have a machine that can do that? by 2050. And he just looked at me and he just said, yes, that was the answer. That was the, so if we're going to do that, you can assume that all the uh, advanced societies have done that, replaced biology with technology, and maybe they don't mind that it takes a long time to go to the center of the galaxy and done that. So we should look there. We continue to look there. Here's just one last thing here. Uh, you know, this is the transit of Venus. You probably saw that, but, uh, you know, there are, literally at least a thousand stars that have been named and charted that can see this kind of thing when the earth gets in front of the sun from their point of view they can watch a transit of the sun by earth they see that happens every 365 days 
So that means they're looking at our system, and it may be that they arrange to send us a message just as the Earth transits the sun, right? So all we have to do to find them is to look in the anti-solar direction all the time. So here are the aliens, you know, these are the aliens down here, broadcasting to Earth here because we got in front of the sun. And all we have to do is just keep looking in the anti-solar direction. We have a little project to do that. Actually, I, I think that that's kind of a nifty thing. So that's where we look. All right. Uh, I think I've made this point, but I'll just say it one more time. And that is, we kind of expect that the aliens will look like they do in the movies. But again, this is just a plot that's been made almost 20, 30 years ago now by Hans Morvich. He's a roboticist uh, in the Carnegie Mellon uh, in, in, in University in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And all he has done here is plot the fastest computers as a function of time. For the three of you who are still awake, I might point out that this is a semi-log plot. So it's going up exponentially. And uh, without, maybe I can move this out of the way here. Um, you can see that when the plot was completed in about, oh, looks like 2005, 2006, something like that, for $1,000, you could buy a computer with the cognitive capability of a lizard, or at least it had that many brain cells. Now, I don't know that a lizard is so interesting, but today in 2020, for $1,000, you know, you're, you're somewhere between a monkey and a human, right? So it's happening. It's happening very quickly. And this presumably will continue to go on. So it's, a, it's really a time scale argument, which is what makes this all very uh, believable. A hundred years ago, 120 years ago, there's Marconi, right, with the first uh, kind of uh, practical radio. By 1945, we already had computers, right? This is a you know military computer. It took the whole room. It's through a lot of vacuum tubes and so forth. But no, it was only 45 years after the invention of radio. We already had computers, and in fact, the uh, assumption is that by you know. 2050, maybe 2150, it really doesn't matter. We will have generalized artificial intelligence. And uh, I guess we become the pets of the computers. That's okay by me because at least pets, uh, you know, have some fun. All right. So I guess my bottom line is simply this. We haven't found ET yet. Uh, I bet everybody that cup of Starbucks that we will by 2035. So you really can't lose. Either you'll have something to talk to yours spouse about at dinner because we found ET, or you get a cup of coffee from me. That's the deal. But it's not going to be these guys. It's going to be something like that. All right, I'm going to leave it there and, you know, allow enough time for, for questions. Seth, that's great. Thanks very much. Declan, Linda, which one of you are we talking to first? Bessie. Bessie Higgs. Okay. Um, thanks, Seth. That was very interesting. I did wonder when you said they'll be looking for oxygen, um, what if the intelligent life out there doesn't rely on oxygen? They may not see the relevance. They may be chemotrophs. Yeah. Well, I, given the, the, the number of questions, I'm going to endeavor to answer them all with one word replies like yes or no. But actually, uh, <laughs> Yeah, they, maybe they don't use oxygen, but you know what? Uh, there's a lot of oxygen. Uh, oxygen, I think, is the third most common element in the cosmos. So there's a lot of oxygen around. And it's, you know, from a chemical point of view, you get a lot more energy breathing oxygen than you do breathing, for example, methane, in case that's what you've been doing so far. You should switch to oxygen. It isn't to say that they will all breathe oxygen, but... If you do find oxygen in somebody's atmosphere, it's uh, you know a good indicator that there's probably some biology, some metabolism down there, plants at least. Seth, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. It's uh, very informative and, and, and very thought provoking. And, and one thought that I have had for a long time is, um, is there something possibly in, in what makes civilizations grow that is based on sort of, um, you know, animal instinct and greed and, and, you know, being cavemen and whatever. 
um, that never goes away and leads to extinction of, of that before we actually reach that point of being self-sufficient, sky-faring uh, space people. You know, is, is that possible? Well, I, I appreciate the optimism, Paul. Uh, I, I would say that a, a lot of people say that we will self-destruct uh, because of this. I mean, it is hardwired into us. Uh, Darwinian evolution always favors the existence of some fraction of the species that doesn't follow the rules, right? Because that, you know, that's a, a degree of genetic plasticity that in the end may have survival value. So you can get by if, you know, 1% of the population steals cars or whatever. That's like, you can get along with that. If 80% of them do it, then the society kind of falls apart. But all you can do is say that, well, I mean, we seem to be still able to keep that in check. I don't think it is likely to ever go away. But the idea that we will self-destruct, I hear that from a lot of people, particularly millennials. They, they are especially optimistic for reasons that I have to say befuddle me. But I did a quick back of the envelope calculation about all the things that are going to take us out. And of course, you have nuclear wars, uh, you know, a popular one. Climate change is, is always good. Uh, people cheating at cards, whatever. I mean, there's just a whole list of things, the pandemics, right? And you can look at the historical effect of these sorts of things. I mean, obviously, we haven't had nuclear war before. But none of them gets rid of more than a few percent of the population. Even in the 14th century, when you had the plague, the Black Plague, yeah, it was an unhappy, uh, unhappy circumstance. But, you know, the, the curve of growth of the population just kept on going up. The only thing that I could find that really could get rid of a lot of people was to let all the nukes fly. So I made the worst case scenario. I said, let them all go. I think they're like 15,000 of them or whatever. And the, the, the most powerful one hits the most, the biggest city and the next one hits the next big in Sydney and 100% effect wipes out everybody in the city and the suburbs. Even so, yeah, I mean, that's not a great day, but even so, you only get rid of a third of the population. So I think it's very hard to get rid of people. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, here in California, it might be a good thing, but we can't get rid of people. Hi there, Seth. Uh, just the uh, frequencies that uh, we're listening on, Seth. Yeah. Well, uh, it, traditionally, it's been, you know, microwaves. There are good reasons for that, most having to do with interference and that sort of thing, but also being able to build an antenna that, you know, where the RMS uh, error in the dish is less than a wavelength. You optical astronomers know all about that, you know, one twentieth wave or whatever. So uh, it has been microwaves. We continue to look at microwaves. Microwaves have the advantage that they do go through uh, the gas and dust of the, of the galaxy without too much problem. And they also go right through the atmosphere without much problem, which means you don't have to get expensive and uncomfortable real estate at the tops of mountains for your radio telescopes. Hi, Seth. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, very nice. I just had one question I printed. Is it possible to visit or tour the uh, Allen Array? It is. It is. Yeah. I mean, these days, California kind of has a lockdown. But that aside, uh, yeah, you can, uh, you know, if you go to San Francisco, for yeah. example, and it's about a five hour drive from San Francisco with lots of interesting scenery of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, various crops in the Central Valley of, of the state. And some but it's, 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 but it's it, open. It, it, it's open to the public. It's not it guarded is. by electric fences or anything. <laughs> no, maybe to keep the astronomers in. Oh, no, okay. it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's it, no, it's no, no, no. It's open right. during business hours. So you know, between about eight in the morning and four o'clock in the afternoon on weekdays. Uh, there's okay. essentially nobody there on the weekends. Yeah. Can I can I just make one other point? This might be a bit pessimistic, but I think radio signals and radio astronomy and us looking for radio signals are it's a very primitive it's very primitive i think there are any advanced alien civilizations out there they're communicating by means we probably haven't even thought of yet dark energy dark matter you name it and i would think the whole radio stuff is just us dipping our toe in the ocean that's well, my thought on it anyway Okay. Well, Steve, you're not the only one to say that to me. I get emails okay. to that effect. But okay. uh, I, I, I can only say that it depends on to the degree to which mm -hmm. our physics is complete. You know, you could say the same about yeah. the wheel. The wheel's pretty old technology. We, we're way beyond that, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I bet, yeah. I bet you use wheels every day. 
good reply. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I guess the question was um, you you mentioned in passing very very quickly um, when you were talking about the recent discovery of phosphine in, in Venus, as that it was possibly a red herring or possibly. Um, you know, we're we're going to be disappointed <laughs> as ever. So, what what was what's your what's your thinking behind it, or what do you think is is going to transpire there? Well, I wasn't involved in in that work, although I did speak to Sarah Seeger about it, and she's you know at MIT. This is kind of her thing, but she was very careful uh, not to say to that you know they had found life because it was very tentative. I think the thing that is somewhat suspect are two things. One, other people have looked and so far have not found that absorption line, which is attributed to phosphine. The second thing is they fitted the data. This is something that's done in astronomy all the time. You've got, you know, some sort of, you know, funky looking curve and you're looking for an absorption line in there. This is a little different than optical and the radio. And, and normally what you do is you just fit a straight line to that curve. Sometimes you'll fit a quadratic, but they, I think they fitted like a 10th order polynomial or something to the curve. And that's suspicious because when you do that, you introduce a lot of wiggles and bumps. And so it may be that the detection is not a real detection. And uh, we'll only know when more people have looked for the line. Yeah. So far, it hasn't been found again. And that's a little depressing. So if you're going to go to Venus mm -hmm. to meet the locals, you know, reconsider. Yeah. It was that you mentioned um, that the chances are we may not ever hear a, a radio signal. And you suggested that we might find um, art or search for artifacts in much the same as, it, as we found the pyramids and other pharaohs. What are our chances of finding artifacts? I mean, the distances are so great. Um, are, are we talking of maybe on Mars? That if there was a, a, um, a civilization on Mars at some stage in the past, and people are inclined to think that now and that it's all burned off, um, that maybe we might find artifacts if we dug deep enough in Mars. You're surely not talking about that. You must be talking about a much, much more distant um, sites. Well, I am. I am, Dennis. Although, you're, you know, feel free to inspect all the rover photos. Uh, you, all you have to do is go online and you can find all the people that have discovered the remains of a society on Mars. <laughs> and, but but not, not, men, not many of them are terribly credible. But, you know, if, if you were a billion years more advanced than Homo sapiens, right? I mean, that's an inconceivable number, and yet it's a possible number. What would you do? You know, there, there have been suggestions that, well, you're, you're going to worry about the fact that the universe is slowing down and eventually it'll go away. You might want to hedge your bet there. Uh, there's a guy at uh, uh, in Illinois, Fermi Labs, uh, and he says, well, advanced societies will go to nearby galaxies and collect stars, use their radiant energy to transport them back to their backyards and collect all these stars so they have a hedge against, you know, uh, not having enough energy to play their records or whatever. Now, you know, that would be an obvious thing to find. I mean, we don't know what artifacts might be out there. Obviously, we don't. But if you saw, you know, a grid of stars is some part of the sky, you know, on a very regular grid, you would say, well, that doesn't look natural. Okay. So I, I and there was an experiment. I just mentioned this one other thing. There was an experiment carried out in Sweden, actually, where they took uh, sky survey photos from some sky survey or other, of, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, I don't remember. And they compared them to photos made more recently to see if there was any difference. You know, did any galaxy suddenly wink out? Or did any stars wink out? And of course, stars do wink out, so you have to be careful. But, you know, they found a handful of objects where, you know, it's just something that you don't expect. That's about all you can do is just be alert. What I didn't realize before, the huge amount of energy you would need to send a signal our way. We're not talking about sending it from uh, Enceladus, Titan, Saturn, no. We're talking about outside our solar system, far, far away. Let's say 20, 30, 30 light years, for instance, 50 light years. They just maybe caught our first uh, TV transmissions. And uh, who's going to use 
radio or light signals, which is roughly the same, both uh, racing away in, with, with light speed, who would use that kind of signal for communication? If you have, let's say, uh, enterprise. Enterprise is going where no one has ever gone before and is 15,000 light years away. And now they find out, oh, oh we, we lost, we, we have no coffee. Scotty, oh dear. back, we need some coffee. How long would that uh, conversation last? So no one would use that kind of signal in our uh, mm -hmm. Euclid universe because it's useless. We can use it here. But then remember that it took how long? Nine hours to send a signal to Pluto, to New Horizon, to turn it a little bit. It takes, what? 20 minutes to send a signal to Mars, depending on where Mars is on its orbit. Inside the solar system, that would be manageable. But outside, yeah, no, I hear you, Ted. Other ways. There must be other ways. Well, I don't know if there are other ways. There are problems. I mean, that that brings you into the the field of faster than light communication. Mm -hmm. and if you have a, a a manner of doing that, I would recommend that you work on that uh, next weekend because you know it'll certainly improve your lifestyle if you can if you can prove that. But uh, it's you know it, it's true. But do keep in mind that, for example, we are broadcasting into space. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, mostly with our radars. Are you sure television, FM radio, they're all going out into space too because they're high enough frequency. But uh, it's the radars. So the airport in Dublin, for example, is, you know, communicating with the stars all the time, 24 hours a day. It's not because they're trying to say anything to the aliens, right? It isn't that they're trying to subscribe to their magazines. It's just, a, you know, something that happens in the course of society. So you know, from our point of view, it's okay if you pick up somebody's radar. That's good, too. Yeah, it's not so interesting to listen to, if you will, but at least proves that there's somebody there, and that's what you're trying yeah. to do. Yeah. Hello, Seth. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering if we were to speculate um, a bit, if uh, you mentioned microwave um, as an alternative way to look for life, I think, a few minutes ago. But if we were to speculate, and if you had no technical limitations, would you consider, would you have in mind any other ways to look for uh, intelligent life in space? Thanks. Well, Alexandra, uh, obviously, you know, looking for flashing laser lights, but as, as uh, somebody already just pointed out, laser and radio, I guess it was Ted, they're, they're not so different. Uh, just diff different frequencies. But I mean, most of the talk was talking about looking for artifacts, something that they built, right? And, and you know, there's an assumption there that as a society gets more and more capable, it builds bigger and bigger things, which might not be true. It has been true historically, right? We build much bigger stuff now than we did a thousand years ago. But if you look at where a lot of technology is going today, it's making stuff smaller, not bigger. So it, it's a little unclear to me, but, you know, if you're really a spacefaring society, if you really want to boldly go where no hominid has ever gone before, right, <laughs> then, then maybe you do build really big stuff. Or you simply rearrange parts of the cosmos, and that stuff you can see. It's true that our best telescopes, maybe you have a telescope that has a tenth of an arc second resolution, right, because you use adaptive optics or something like that. Well... If, if that, you know, you're looking at something that's 100 or 200 light years away, that means that it has to be at least the size of Ireland for you to be able to see it, you know, unless it reflects a lot of light, which is possible. So there are limitations. But the, the whole point is simply that waiting for a signal is one approach, and it's been used for 60 years. But another approach is to look for things that have been done in the universe by very advanced societies that might do a whole lot more than the, the next hundred societies put together and see if you can find anything that doesn't look right. Can you expect that uh, elect the electromagnetic sin sign signal can be deviated or distorted by uh, effects of gravity? Uh, and maybe can be a reason why they are difficult to found? Yeah. 
Well, Lisa, it's true. I mean, you'll just have to ask Al Einstein, although he doesn't say much these days. But, you know, and he pointed out that indeed anything that uh, has mass will bend electromagnetic radiation. But it's a very, very small effect unless you have a very, very big mass, something the size of a supermassive black hole, maybe. But for the rest of the cosmos, no, it has almost no effect, right? I mean... You can, if you, if you pick up a radio wave coming from that direction in space, you know, even if it's passed through a, a cluster of galaxies, it's only very slightly changed in its apparent position. So it's, it's a, it, in general, a very small effect. I wouldn't worry about that. If you have things to worry about, Elisa, don't worry about this. Uh, question on just in terms of over the years, um, obviously technology gets cheaper and get improves, but does that make the search easier or does it make it more difficult given that you have other discoveries happening at the same time and you think, if only I knew that last year, I would go back to that particular area that we were <laughs> looking at. Uh, that's one question. Then the other question, the second follow on to that is, is it the advance of technology that makes you hold the belief that 2035 is a realistic time to find some something interesting or, or what's behind your belief of 2035? Well, uh, thank you, Mike, for the question. Uh, actually, the, the, the motivation for my, uh, my bet with this audience, and it was actually in Hamburg, Germany at the time, uh, that you know, we'll find something by 2035, it was simply to antagonize the audience, something that I usually can do without making any bets. So, uh, it, but it is, you're correct, it is based on the improvements in technology. If you plot any indicator of the speed of SETI searches, in other words, how many star systems are looked at per year or per month or something. That number keeps improving by about a factor of two every couple of years. And that's just the improvement in computer technology. With, the, with bigger computers, you can have more you know, radio channels you observe at once, et cetera, et cetera. So there are also, it's like doing astronomy. You know, as the technology gets better, you can do more research per unit time. And that's all it is. Uh, thanks for the talk, Seth. That was really, really interesting. Um, I was wondering what kind of signal analysis do you do on the, the stuff that the dish, dishes do receive? You know, do you assume it's just on or off or what kind of processing, what, what are you even looking for? I suppose it's, you know, we, we see the pulsars, they're regular, they're blips, but you know, why do we assume it's like that? Or I'm wondering what else do you look for? Yeah. Well, Declan, having lived in Holland for a while, I kind of recognize the artist behind you. Uh, <laughs> starry night, such as we never saw in Holland. It's well, always cloudy. Yeah, it's always cloudy. It's probably like Ireland, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, the kind of signal we look for is just, there's actually, for most SETI, it's a dead simple uh, algorithm that we use. It doesn't even deserve the, the Greek etymology of algorithm, because all it is is looking for a narrow band component of the signal, because that's something only transmitters make. Quasars, pulsars, none of them make a narrow band signal. Okay, so if you find a narrow band signal, then you say, I don't know what it is, Bob, but it's gotta be somebody who can wire together a transmitter. <laughs> and that's all we look for. Remember, in order to get the modulation, in order to get the message, you have to be able to see the variations in the signal over very brief moments of time. Your television signal, right, it's, it's changing by at least 5 million times a second, more now, right, 5 million times a second. So if, you're, if your receiver can't detect that very rapid change in the signal, then you don't get the message. But on the other hand, you know, it's like what you do when you make a, do an astrophotography evening, right? You, you make exposures that are minutes, maybe, maybe a half hour. So all the very fast changes in the image have gone away, but that doesn't matter because, you know, most nebulae don't change very much in a half an hour. But that's what we do in SETI too. So we average over at least a couple of minutes. So all the message is gone. If we were to find a narrowband signal, you can bet that everybody in the world would be chipping in money to build a better receiver, a lot bigger antenna, and try and see if we can get the message. And then we would turn it loose on the internet and see if anybody could figure it out. Seth, I, uh, I, 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 I really admire your enthusiasm. <laughs> and I, I, I go back to something you said very early on, what people 
say to you at parties <laughs> when you reveal who you are um, and something along the lines of uh, well are you nearly there yet mm. and yes. you said that well you can't tell whether you really, really, really nearly there or not um, you either found it or you haven't and you haven't found it yet um, but some, something drives you forward. I mean, you've been at this game since 1990, I think you told us. Mm -hmm. And something drives you forward and you must get up every day and you say, well, um, for 30 years I found nothing, but today maybe I'll find something. Is that basically how it goes? Well, no, Peter, actually, I don't get up every day and say that to myself. I, I probably would have, you know, slashed my wrist by now if I did that. <laughs> I don't do that. No, what I usually say is, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, eight more Zoom meetings today. That's probably what I say. And uh, 300 emails. But uh, I do think that, you know, I mean, the, the bet wasn't entirely in jest to say that it's my opinion that we will find something. It's maybe more a wish than anything else. I wouldn't argue otherwise. But on the other hand, unless this whole idea of looking for signals or looking for visual evidence unless that's completely wide of the mark, then it's something that should happen within the lifetime of everybody on this, uh, on this call. And, uh, and that, that's, that's remarkable in itself, because you could have been born you know, during the time of Julius Caesar, and there was not very much hope of hearing about the aliens then. So you should be grateful for that. Well, Seth, you've proved yourself to be what some of us knew already, an amazing communicator. And to, to those of you, by the way, who don't know, I, I very much recommend you explore the SETI Institute's website. And in particular, can I draw your attention to a weekly podcast called Big Picture Science, with which Seth has been too modest to mention. <laughs> and I, I, I definitely recommend you have a look at that and maybe subscribe to it. It's, it's not all about, uh, well, I, I suppose everything there has some indirect connection with searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, but you have to dig very deep to find out the connection. And for example, one recent episode was about uh, um, uh, finding uh, creatures in the, in the deep ocean um, and uh, competing with the mining companies who are... Um, who are ready to dredge up the uh, bottom of the ocean and destroy things as yet undiscovered before they are actually discovered. Um, and that was fascinating. And I really recommend you have a look at that. And I just want to underline how privileged we were, Seth. And uh, we, believe you me, we feel this privilege greatly that you should have uh, taken the time off from your busy day and added one more Zoom meeting <laughs> to the various ones that you're gonna to have to endure for the rest of the day. Um, so on behalf of Cork Astronomy Club, can I issue you the warmest of our thanks? Alas, I do have to go, not of my own volition. Obviously I have a big warm spot in my heart for Ireland uh, for reasons that are obvious and maybe not even so obvious. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. You've been uh, uh, you know, a wonderful audience and uh, certainly more conscious than most of the audiences that I speak to. So I, I appreciated that too. Also literate. <laughs> the Irish are literate. <laughs> okay, I'll say goodbye to you and let you all uh, eat dinner or whatever. Okay, okay so Thank thanks you. very much. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you.